My last video was a vlog, my first, filmed at Makaha Beach. Well, I lost two things, my glasses on the sand and a couple of subscribers. So today, I thought I would read from my personal, very juicy essay. Uh-oh. Hi, BookTube. This is Marilyn M.M., the baby boomer BookTuber, and welcome to my new video. Uh, before I start, I just want to warn you of a few triggers. Uh, one is of eating disorders, and one is about mental illness. So if any of these things trigger you, you can skip this video. Um, I'm going to read a personal essay that I wrote five years ago during the Rio Gymnastics. And uh, if you stay tuned at the end, I have a treat. I would call it a proof of life type of thing. So just stay tuned at the end. I also have some books to share with you. So as you can guess, this is about the Olympics, but it's not exactly about the Olympics. Um, the Olympics, the Paralympics is going to be on my birthday. And this is what uh, got me into the, gave me the idea that um, to take out my dusty old um, blog post from my personal blog and uh, fix it up a little bit. Um, so anyway, here goes. Yes, that's me. I'm in Rio at the gymnastics final, doing a round-off back handspring at the balance beam. Last night, I stuff-blocked a ball from the Australians in beach volleyball and enjoyed a pat on my tiny rear by my teammate Twig. Tonight, I run the 100-meter race in track and field. I will. Me, against the whole Jamaican team. In reality, I'm a 65-year-old woman who struggles with severe arthritis and frequent bouts of madness. Escapism is the tendency to seek distraction and relief from unpleasant realities, especially by seeking entertainment or engaging in fantasy. I read that in the dictionary. But now recognize it as a precious gift provided by my mental illness. I'm such an Olympics fanatic that I make Leslie Jones appear demure. I walk the balance beams, a.k.a. the brown lines of my ceramic tile floor. But the most energetic moves I manage are the gymnastics, fake salute, and at the start of their routines and their proud ma match march from apparatus to apparatus, or in my case, from the couch to the fridge, while juggling a pint of haagen vanilla. Yet in my mind, I'm there with my teams, all the teams. I have a gold medal in make-believe. I need this, I use this gift to escape a chaotic childhood. It works better than any other soothing techniques I've tried, like eating my weight in potato chips or marrying every man who asked me, all four of them. Making believe makes sense. I pretend I'm young and forget my aches and pains. I hardly notice when people are mean or hurtful, and I live a wonderful life in my mind. And I guess that's what counts. I always wrote stories in my head, acting out the dialogue in front of dusty glass, looking at my blurred image in front of dark televisions intensified the fantasy. I, envis I envisioned a jet-setting life while de dealing with misery, poverty, and abuse. I belonged nowhere. I was too much of this and not enough of that. My first grade teacher gave me lollipops every day because I was the best reader. And I accumulated a stash of sweetness. But life soured 
when Mrs. Edwards, who my mother called a sadist, screamed about my sloppy pen penmanship. At least she didn't put me under her desk and kick me, like she did to the kids who spoke no English. I don't know when my anxiety disorder emerged. As a child, everyone and everything scared me. The list was long. Pills I couldn't swallow, clowns who bullied me, and especially my unstable mother. She force-fed me until I was 12 and tried to burn pimples away with hot water. I held many words inside that rarely emerged. Fear does that. Yet, I recited poems by heart in front of my mother's friends and later sang and acted in school plays. As long as I wasn't myself, I was fine. Or was I? Large periods of my life found me either locked inside or binging on food, boys, and danger to soothe my troubled soul. I was 10 when the Olympics first aired on television in 1960. That year, they held the competition in Rome, Italy, watching the Soviet Union and other iron country co uh, curtain countries collect gold medals while leaping, jumping, and belly flopping on mats held me spellbound. That year, Akibe Bikila from Ethiopia, running barefoot, achieved the first gold medal by a black African in the marathon. Cassius Clay, who four years later joined the Nation of Islam and changed his name to Muhammad Ali, won the gold medal in boxing. Perhaps most of all, Rome itself, in its historical splendor, showcased the wonder of travel and Olympic glory. The gymnastic events took place at the Kara, I think it's Karachala baths, thermal baths, and the Basilica of Max Antius set the scene for wrestling. I was hooked. The Olympics became a family tradition. We loved all the events, but gymnastics was our favorite. No matter how unhealthy I got, I saw myself as just a smidgen away from Nadia Komenich, who at age 14 scored, scored the first perfect 10 in an Olympic gymnastic event. Nadia was a perfect 10. In real life, I was zero, a zero. But every four years, pretending made me flawless. My most unusual encounter with the Olympics collided with a period in 1997 when I struggled with agoraphobia and an empty nest aggravated by daily bouts of vertigo. When my youngest daughter left for college, I became a recluse. But again, the Olympics came to my rescue. Shannon Miller from the 1996 Games came to town with three of her magnificent seven teammates. I made it my goal to attend the exhibition show. My daughter and I loved all the gymnasts that year, but Shannon ruled with her tood when she raised her arms and forced a half-second smile, we knew she was a contender, a force. The day of the show, I trudged out of the house, my heart beating like a bird's wing against a glass window. I fainted at the bus stop, ending up in the emergency room with a severe panic attack. Did that deter me? No siree. I arrived in time for the show with my hospital bracelet and still attached to my wrist, courtesy of the ER staff. After a flawless performance, the show's organizers invited the audience to take photos with their favorite champions for a mere $7. I would amaze my daughter when I casually handed her a photo of my idol with moi. When it was my turn, Shannon, gracious, smiled her performance smile, only a tad more genuine than her grimace. But I was shy. I crossed my arms in front of me, careful not to touch and defile her. Then I smiled. Wow, me and Shannon Miller. Wow was right. At five feet two and, a hundred and 200 pounds, I looked down at the photo, horrified. We clashed. When I reached the safety of my home, I broke down. What had I done to myself? As my panic attacks increased, so had my weight. Standing next to an Olympic athlete didn't help my image or eating problems. But the photo helped me clarify how past traumas had affected my health and appearance. 
I took steps to heal my body, if not yet my soul. An obsession with a gymnast led me out of my house and was a gift. I spent several more years living almost always in my walk-in closet, but I always came out for the Olympics. Neighbors who rarely, rarely saw me outside lounged in front of my television, drinking boxed wine and eating pizza. The father next door cut five rings out of cardboard, pasting them in a white poster board. His kids stuck on stars. For a while, I forgot about my troubles. I cheered for the winners and cried with the losers. The Olympics rivaled reading, hiding, and even Cinnabon for sheer distraction from stress. Friends warned about the dangers of living in a dream world. They were wrong. Imagination and enthusiasm healed me. When I stopped worrying about what others thought about my looks and quirky behavior, I felt prettier and saner. Fake it till you make it, they say. My small circle accepted me, even though they didn't understand my anxieties or those hard days when leaving the house proved impossible. I never lost my childish awe of spectacles like the Olympics. So yesterday, while watching gymnastics, I leaped into the air holding a soft medical weight. I imagined it was a ryth uh, gymnastics rhythmic ball. When I snapped back to reality, I found myself not in Rio, but in my house in Hawaii. I laughed. Not caring, I pulled a muscle in my leg and sprained my ankle. Nothing hurt, because in my mind, I was Simone Biles reaching for that final gold medal. Now I look at that photo of Shannon Miller and me with compassion. I don't hate the woman in the black tent dress next to the girl dressed in red, white, and blue. I'm ready to walk the full length of the balance beam of life without falling on my face. The end. Okay, now for the surprise. This is a close-up of me and Shannon Miller. If you look closely, you can see the hospital bracelet on my arm. Thank you for listening to my essay. Um, that was written five years ago. So now I'm a seven, almost 71 year old woman who watches the Olympics. Don't get me wrong. The Olympics is not a perfect competition. A lot of bad things happen at the Olympics. And, um, I'm not trying to say that it's a wonderful, a totally wonderful event. And some people hate the Olympics. But um, that was my experience. I want to share a few books with you now. Um, I don't have them on me, so they'll be in this corner. The first book is called Olympic Pride, American Prejudice, the untold story of 18 African Americans who defied Jim Crow and Adolf Hitler to compete in the 1936 Berlin Olympic. And uh, it says, the astonishing, inspirational, and largely unknown true story of the 18 African-American athletes who competed in the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games, defying the racism of both Nazi Germany and the Jim Crow South, set against the turbulent backdrop of a segregated United States, 16 black men and two black women are torn between boycotting the Olympic Games in Nazi Germany or participating. If they go, they would represent a country that considered them second-class citizens and would um, compete amid a strong undercurrent of Aryan superiority that considered them inferior. Yet if they stayed, would they ever have a chance to prove them wrong on a global stage, to be better than anyone ever expected? So that sounds like a book that I would like to read, and I especially like the fact that it's about African-American Olympians. Um, the next book, which will be here, is For the Glory of Duncan Hamilton, the untold and inspiring story of Eric Liddell, hero of Chariots of Fire. Um, Chariots of Fire was a movie that 
um, I, I think I saw many years ago about um, two men, one uh, a Christian and one a Jew, who compete in the Olympics. I'm not sure if they became friends, but I, I really want to see that movie again. But this is the story of the non-Jewish person. And um, he, it says, hero, from his Olympic medal to his missionary work in China to his last brave years in a Japanese work, work camp during World War II. And um, he did a lot of wonderful things when he was in the uh, Japanese work camp. So um, I think I want to read that book as well as watch the movie Chariots of Fire. Um, for a middle grade book, um, and this I got from a commercial that's on TV about the Paralympic swimmer, um, Jessica Long. And it's called Unsinkable, and it'll be here, From Russian Orphan to Para Paralympic Swimming World Champion. And she's the second most decorated U.S. Olympic uh, swimmer. She's born in Siberia, adopted from a Russian orphanage and at 13 months old and she had to have her legs cut off and um, it's I don't know if she'll be in this year's Paralympics but I plan to watch it. Uh, the last book is a book about Duke Kahanamoku who was uh, he was um, he introduced surfing to the rest of the world he didn't, just, you know, invent surfing. Surfing was done by Hawaiians many, many years before that. Um, and I, I was reading about him, and I found it very interesting. So it's called Water Man, The Life and Times of Duke Kahanamoku. And this was, uh, this was published in 2015. And it's the first comprehensive biography of Duke Kahanamoku, 1890 and 1968. Swimmer, surfer. Olympic gold medalist, Hawaiian icon, and waterman. Uh, he was born on my birthday, which, you know, I think is really cool. And he also surfed in Makaha as well as other surfing places. And um, he won the, he became the first swimmer to win the Olympic 100 meter freestyle twice in a row. This came after his first title eight years earlier in Stockholm. He went on to claim a silver medal in the event in the 1924 Olympics in Paris and is also known and honored throughout the world as the man who popularized the sport of surfing. Uh, he was also known as a very gentle, kind person and he even saved people from a tragedy uh, by uh, picking them off from his surfboard. I read this and uh, I'm really interested in reading this, more about this. Well. We come to the end of my oversharing video. Um, I hope you liked it. Uh, please let me know in the comments what you thought. And I'm still looking for questions and answers for my um, one year anniversary on BookTube, which is coming up on my birthday, the 24th. So please like and subscribe if you're so inclined. And I'll meet you here again for another video. Aloha.